Recently, I've been going through a bit of a mental health crisis. As anyone who struggles with depression or anxiety would know, hobbies, things that we typically find enjoyable, quickly become less rewarding. For a change of pace, I have applied to study at the Institute of Ismaili Studies, but the multiple rejections have started to weigh on me. My study of Ismaili history and philosophy hasn't been stimulated by external forces like academia, vocation, or, as the plague of the 2020 sloughs on, blunt. A few months ago, I received this message on Instagram, asking me to cover the Honorable Imam Hakim B. Amrila. Before this point, I had only done cursory research on Imam al Hakim B. Amrila as part of my Too Long Didn't Read Imamat History series and my Too Long Didn't Read Ismaili History lectures. And what I had researched so far had been less than flattering. It's obvious from these messages that this person was expecting a glowing redemption of our most politically controversial imam. A redemption I couldn't at the time and can't at this time provide. It was clear that I needed to do more research on this subject. Polly Walker's Caliph of Cairo showed up a lot in my initial research, so $33 and a few weeks later I got started in earnest. Like many IIS publications, this is not an IIS publication, but Walker has been published many times by the Institute, Caliph offers pages and pages of first and second hand resources, translating contemporary reports almost in their entirety. Walker fills in the gaps with unbiased commentary both on the reliability of his sources as well as supplementary information that isn't present in his translations, with citations. While this was a good sign for my research and my academic integrity, I thought this may not provide exactly what this Instagram stranger was looking for. Walker's sources are mainly governmental. They document the day-to-day -day activities of the Caliph, his policies, his seemingly arbitrary changes to policy, and his long list of official executions in chronological order spanning the first few years of his reign. Before I get started, I would recommend reading the full text of Caliph of Cairo. Please grab a copy and read it if you're interested in an unbiased view of this topic. The Mad Caliph received that moniker for the absolutely atrocious acts he committed during his reign over the Fatimid Empire. Paul E. Walker writes, Christians and Jews, by contrast, long remembered Al-Hakim as their persecutor, a man who made them wear large crosses and bells in public places, and who ordered many of their churches and synagogues destroyed. One of these churches was, in fact, the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, the destruction of which sent shock waves throughout all Christendom. During his reign, Caliph al-Hakim bi Amrla made few friends and kept even fewer. His treatment of his constituents led to widespread speculation throughout Europe and the neighboring Abbasid Empire. His career as Fatimid Caliph has echoed throughout the halls of history, being exaggerated and reiterated in poetry such as Voyage en Orient in 1851 and The New Yorker in 1996. He's even been inserted into classical literature such as A Thousand and One Arabian Nights and Conan the Barbarian, not to mention the dozens of other references strewn across literature and the internet at large. His legacy usually consists of a short list of atrocities, nearly identical in every instance. We'll describe these in detail soon, but even without knowing his deeds, there is something fascinating about a mad caliph. When we think of mad in a titular sense, it can often refer to an evil character. And I think many often assume that's the case for Caliph al-Hakim as well, especially in light of his actions. But the term mad in England English refers most often to a mental imbalance, foolishness, and insanity. We have a number of examples from contemporary literature. The mad king rules the seven kingdoms with an iron fist and a genetic penchant for violence. The Mad Hatter thinks in circles and can't express himself properly due to lead poisoning. The Mad Titan, while exceedingly logical, still commits mass slaughter on a universal scale. For some, these words may seem archaic or even unacceptable, but terms like crazy and mad do have historical significance. Our understanding of psychology, both medically and colloquially, 
have advanced at an incredible rate in the last few decades. But just because we have more specific terminology now, doesn't mean the phenomena we're describing is new. In order to understand why mad is an appropriate moniker, as opposed to evil or tyrannical, we have to look at the Caliph's actions. Thanks to the tireless work of Salim Lalani, the ex-Ismaili movement has found new wind this year. Among the normal complaints of cultural supremacy, suspicions over finance, and a general distaste for organized religion, the Mad Caliph has re-emerged as a prominent yet infrequent talking point. Citing two encyclopedias, one of their Instagram posts makes the bold and repeatable claim, if the Mad Caliph did all these terrible things, why is he revered by Ismailis as an imam? Of course, what this post and the many that came before it eludes is context. This is why this article is 12,524 words long with an audio recording, and why Walker's book is 284 pages of mostly direct translations, and why the Ismaili Instagram post is an Instagram post. If you spark notes the reign of Caliph al Hakim bi Amrullah and ignore the context, it is easy to frame his absolute terror. In his video on the subject, Dr. Khalil Anani begs for consideration of this context, and he provides it in a way to help his viewers further their understanding of the Mad Caliph's actions. Al-Makrisi and Al-Musabihi, the two historians Walker pulls from the most, paint an intoxicating picture of Al-Hakim's rule. They list without moral commentary except for one cheer, the acts and declarations of the caliph, sometimes on a yearly basis, sometimes on an hourly basis. With what's left of their documentation, Walker is able to scaffold a Lakito perspective of the caliph's life, distanced yet intimate. And when you press C down and look at the larger image, you see one unmistakable through line, the extreme implementation of Shia jurisprudence. Those who defend the caliph cite the strict implementation of Ismaili laws more than any other Fatimid caliph before or after. Although, we can all admit that the consequences were more dire than any other caliph. We'll see the caliph face a variety of problems throughout his tenure. His contemporaries would say he faced, his contemporaries would say he faced more adversity than any other Fatimid caliph. As we're about to learn, Al-Hakim would address these issues, informed by both Islamic jurisprudence and political precedent. Before we can begin to understand why the arm of Al-Hakim's law was so strong, we need to dig into the specifics of what he did. Even today, there are Muslims that vilify music, claiming that it is a distraction from religion, and when religion and state are intertwined, distraction from the affairs of state are a distraction from religious duties. If someone in Al-Hakim's government were to abandon their civil duties to enjoy the local music scene, it would be worthy of note, maybe even of reprimand. Barjawan was Al-Hakim's personal tutor. When he became the caliph at age 11, Barjawan became his chief advisor. Four years later, Barjawan became the first of dozens of advisors executed by the young caliph. Walker cites one reason as the young caliph's paranoia of losing power to his advisors something we'll touch on later. He cites other lapses in duty and etiquette, but what stood out to me was this description. So enamored of these musical sessions was Bergevon that he remained at home listening to the performances through the morning hours, while those in need of his services as chief executive of the state had to wait outside his door. Over the next decades, Music would continue to be banned in public and private spaces across the Fatimid Empire. We have a few records of underground parties featuring musicians, and no other recorded punishment for these was as severe as Barjawan's. But at an early age, Al-Hakim proved that any contradiction to his law will be met swiftly and thoroughly. Islamic Sunnah controversially puts the onus for women's safety on women themselves. The most prominent example is the head covering. 
Some Muslims will argue that it's a man's responsibility not to leer at women. Others would argue that it's a woman's responsibility not to be leered at. Unfortunately, one side of that argument, codified into practice and even into law for the Muslims, often cites in suggestions for women's behavior, is the chapter of combined forces, stating, settle in your homes and do not display yourselves as women did in the days of pre-Islamic ignorance. The message this verse of the Quran sends is clear. Keep women safe by keeping them at home. Al-Hakim used to ride through the streets of Cairo every night. Soon, people started gathering and partying in the streets to accompany him. Among them were lots of women and lots of drunk men. Al-Makrisi writes about them in December of the year 1000. Of those going out at night, women outnumbered the men. Crowds in the street and roads increased. The large number of them who were intoxicated became evident. The matter was especially acute from the night of 19th until 24th December. When the people had exceeded the proper bounds, Al-Hakim ordered that women not go out from evening time onward. If they did, they were given an exemplary punishment. A quick visit to your local street party can tell you that drunk men and many women is not the safest combination. To address this concern four years later, the caliph bans women from showing their faces or wearing jewelry in public, along with enforcing loincloths in public baths, applying Islam's modesty standards in a place it hadn't been applied before. Another 10 years after, women were prevented from gathering publicly altogether. Women did not go out to the desert and no woman was seen at the tombs. Gathering on the banks of the Nile was forbidden, as well as women riding in the boats with men and their going to places where they might be closely confined with men. The closely confined with men clarification does a lot of the heavy lifting of these rulings. When we look at the implementation of these seemingly outrageous decrees, we can see that they're simply extensions of existing Islamic jurisprudence. In January of 1004, women were prevented from leaving the house at all, and soon cobblers were banned from even making shoes for women. Keep them safe by keeping them at home. One of the descriptions of the caliph's eccentricities commonly shared is bans on various kinds of vegetables and shellfish. I'm quoting from the before mentioned Instagram post, which cites Encyclopedia Britannica. Here, I think it's important to point out that Ismailis, of which the Imam Fatimid Caliph is the leader, are Shia Muslims. Likewise, the laws from the Caliph of Cairo would follow Shia jurisprudence. So instead of pulling from a hadith of the Prophet, I'll pull from a hadith of Imam al-Baqir. Muhammad ibn Muslim asks, we are given fish that do not bear an extra layer on them. The Imam replied, Eat all fish that have scales, and do not eat those that do not. If you want a full list of what Shia can and cannot eat, clear out the next hour and a half and click the link in the notebook post. Like many food-based laws in Islam, you can also find the specification in Leviticus. And there's still an ongoing debate as to the purpose of these food restrictions, with most arguments revolving around cleanliness. Nowadays, Shia scholars say that scaleless, finless fish eat dirt or have wonky digestive systems, but I'm not an ichthyologist. For the vegetables, we have to get more specific, keeping in mind that we're working with Shia jurisprudence. Walker again quotes directly from al-Makrizi, this time in October 1004. A decree was issued concerning foodstuffs. It forbade eating mulukia, which had been much loved by Muavia ibn Abi Sufyan, and another green leaf called Jirjir that was associated with Aisha, may God be pleased with her, and Mutawakkilia, connected to the Abbasid Caliph al Mutawakkil. While this is not specifically a law, this presents an example of al Hakim's spite. Being an Ismaili Imam from a Fatimid Caliph, Al-Hakim was the descendant of cousin, son-in-law, best friend, and roommate of the Prophet, Ali ibn Abi Talib. As the heir of Imam Ali, you can imagine how much Al-Hakim wouldn't have liked Muawiyah, Aisha, or the Umayyads, and later the Abbasids in general. If you can't imagine that, 
Let's take a quick look at the first fitna, as described by al Muqazimah on YouTube. YouTube. On June 18th, 656, Ali became the fourth Khalifa. He reigned for around five years, and his time was the most turbulent yet dear to the first fitna. First of all, Ali moved his capital to Kufa in Mesopotamia. Secondly, he had some problems with the Banu Umayyah, especially Muawiyah, the governor of Syria. Uthman was also a member of Banu Umayyah, and if there was anything this family taught their kids, it was to stick together. And boy, did they stick together. Muawiyah demanded that the rebels, each and every one of them, be killed. But a lot of those people who rebelled were Ali's supporters. Ali couldn't do that. The disagreement blew up into a full-scale civil war between Ali and Muawiyah. The two main battles of the civil war were the Battle of Kamal and the Battle of Sifin. Both of these battles are highly controversial and debated, and I couldn't find any accounts of them that I found logical enough to discuss. So, let me just give you an overview of the civil war. First battle in 656 CE, the Battle of Kamal was fought between Aisha, Muhammad's widow, and Ali, Muhammad's heir, cousin, and son-in-law. It was fought due to some confusion during negotiations. Aisha Aisha demanded justice for Uthman and well, it blew up into a battle. Ali won the battle and decided to forgive everyone and move on. Second battle was the Battle of Sifin. It was fought between Muawiyah and Ali in 657 CE. The loss of life was heavy and out of fear for further war, negotiation was started. It was clear then that there was gonna be no more fighting because it was unbearable to think that Muslims were killing Muslims. Out of Ali's supporters, the former rebels- In case you missed it, Muawiyah and Aisha teamed up with the Quraysh to take down the new Caliph Ali. While Aisha and other companions of the Prophet are respected and even revered by Ismailis today, 1004 had, quote, quite a bit of disparagement and vilification of the right of the two sheikhs Abu Bakr and Umar. May God be pleased with them both, unquote. As well as further insults towards the companions being inscribed on walls, tombs, and mosques. The Abbasids, on the other hand, were longtime rivals of the Fatimids, both fighting over North Africa and the various holy lands. As alluded to in the Instagram convo at the beginning, the Abbasids also manifested personal beef with Caliph al-Hakim. While not strictly jurisprudence, the banning of salad certainly fits this category of extreme implementation. The same can be said for the Caliph's dislike of dogs. In Islam, just like in Judaism, dogs are considered impure and can even nullify prayers. Muslims even today use these beliefs as justification to cause harm to dogs and other pets. Islamic jurisprudence emphasizes that dogs can be used for certain purposes, like hunting, but stray dogs serve no purpose. With the number of stray dogs in Cairo and the surrounding areas quickly growing, as well as more frequent attacks on citizens, led al-Hakim to take action. In 1005, the caliph ordered all stray dogs in Cairo to be put to death. He repeated the calling every few years afterwards. By today's standards, this may be considered the worst of al-Hakim's policies. A cursory YouTube search shows the dog-killing caliph of Cairo, even before Dr. Kalalandani's explanation. The relationship between Muslims and the other Abrahamic faiths have always been tense. Christians and Jews are considered protected people under Islamic law. Many of the less constructive acts allowed against non-believers were not allowed against Christians and Jews. Those living under Umayyad and Abbas rule paid a religious tax in order to live in newly Muslim lands. While often vilified, this tax for non-Muslims was comparable to the religious tax the Muslims already paid. The Fatimids reduced, or removed, there's conflicting sources, this tax on non-Muslims. And Christians and Jews were granted more freedom than they'd had under the Umayyads. Many prominent Christians and a few prominent Jews were even promoted to positions in the government. Even Fatimid caliphs were known to marry a Christian or two. But this all changed with Caliph al-Hakim. At the same time as his salad ban, the caliph ordered the Jews and Christians of the empire to identify themselves with black belts and black badges. Black was chosen because of its association with the Abbasids. The same decree bans the sale of slaves to Christians and Jews. In 1008, Caliph al-Hakim received a report about a ritual taking place in Jerusalem where a Christian priest would light the candles of his congregation, claiming that the fire descended from heaven. The ritual was an obvious illusion, insulting both Muslims and believing Christians. Upon hearing the report, the Caliph ordered the destruction of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, where the ceremony took place, quote, and have the people plunder it so thoroughly all traces of it were obliterated. Unquote. The holy site was destroyed the following year. 
He also ordered all the churches and synagogues within the empire to be burned down, but fearing backlash from the Christians didn't follow through. Christians were also prohibited from publicly celebrating their holidays like Epiphany and the Feast of the Cross. In 1012, the caliph ordered Christians to wear black turbans or hoods and wear heavy wooden crosses around their necks. They were prevented from riding horses and were prevented from buying or renting mules instead. Al-Makrizi notes, The crosses the Christians wore on their necks now had to be a cubit in length and width, about a foot and a half. Their humiliation increased, as did the oppression imposed on them. An order specified that the weight of the cross be five pounds and that it be visible on the outside of their robes. So they did that. But when matters began to oppress them most heavily, many of them fiend Islam. In the following years, as restrictions increased on both Jews and Christians, many fled the empire altogether, making their way to Byzantine land. Scholars believe Caliph al-Hakim's mother was a Christian, according to the documentation of Michael, Bishop of Tennis, which makes his particular dislike of all things Christian even more pertinent. Abbasid leaders with their biases would claim that the Caliph was ashamed of his Christian mother and would instead overcompensate with Islamic rule. Up to this point, the Fatimid Empire had not gone to the same lengths as the Umayyads or the Abbasids to convert their constituency to Islam. In fact, the Ismailis, while making up a notable portion of the government, were a minority within the empire. The oppression of Christians and Jews could have been to motivate conversion to Islam instead of just a side effect. Contrary to Netflix, alcohol is forbidden to Muslims. Despite this, many of the Fatimid elite, including the Caliph's family, would often attend secret parties just outside the capital. Al-Hakim despised these parties and heavily punished those who attended. Eventually, unlike the Fatimid caliphs before him, al-Hakim decided to outlaw alcohol to everyone under his jurisdiction, not just the Muslims. In November 1008, the consumption of wine was forbidden in the empire. Al-Makrizi describes the atmosphere before the decree. Word spread among the people that the selling of wine would be forbidden. They rushed out to buy it and bought a great deal. It became so dear that ten jars of it sold for a dinar, then it could no longer be found. Before the ban, wine was selling for about $30 per bottle. I don't know about wines, but according to the Vivina rating, that's like a four-star wine, which is generally expensive. But this was the least of the Fatimid Somalier community's problems. As is the Caliph's pattern of taking Muslim rulings to the extreme, it wasn't enough for him to ban wine in his empire. Al-Makrizi continued. In January 1012, the selling of large and small quantities of raisins was forbidden, and a circular letter prohibited transporting them. Many were thrown into the Nile. Great quantities of raisins were burned. The burning of raisins continued for several days in the presence of witnesses. The supervisor of the Bureau of Expenditure continued the supply of funds spent on transporting and burning them. Burning 2,340 units of raisins cost, in the expenditure for that purpose alone, 5,000 dinars, about $1.3 million, over a period of 10 days. Following our pattern, what we're seeing is an extreme reaction. But Al-Makrizi also provides some insight into the reasoning. The caliph allows, temporarily, selling grapes in quantities of less than six pounds, under the assumption that they would not be crushed into juice. The next year, the caliph bans honey, sinking 5,000 jars of it into the Nile. At this point, a decade and a half into his career, the caliph is not only banning the consumption of alcohol, but he's also banning products that can make alcohol, namely grapes for wine and honey for meat. Fatimid citizens suspect he'll ban wheat, which is used to make beer, and quickly begin to hoard their bread once these decrees are made. This idea of preventing the potential of a crime in addition to the crime is also applied to astrology. Fortune telling is held in the Quran in the same regard as the consumption of alcohol. Both are mentioned in the table chapter, chapter 5, verse 90. Just like banning the potential of alcohol included destroying harmless grapes and honey, Banning the potential of astrology decimated one of the Fatimid's greatest exports to date, astronomy. Al-Makrizi describes, Discoursing about the stars was forbidden. 
a number of astrologers absented themselves. A group of those who remained were banished and the people were warned not to hide any of them. One group publicly expressed repentance and they were forgiven. They swore that they would not investigate the stars. There are other instances of the Caliph's extremism throughout the historic record, but I hope these examples can outline al-Hakim's public policy. Each of his decrees and declarations, while exaggerated to an unsettling degree, obviously have their origins in Shia jurisprudence. These are examples of Sunnah, the Hadiths, and the Quran taken to the extreme. I want to point out clearly that I am not justifying the actions of the Mad Caliph. We can see much of what the Caliph did reflected in our world today, both in online discourse and in public policy. The justification that the Caliph could have used for his policy is still thriving in the Muslim world today. In his video, Andani argues that these laws were implemented in order to drive more conversions to Shia Islam, creating a pro-Shia public state policy. This extreme implementation of Shia-specific jurisprudence did not go unnoticed. There were a small number of revolts across the massive empire, some led by outside influences and most supported by local tribes. Like indigenous people around the world, the Bedouin of North Africa were cast aside by the colonizing Muslim empires. Even the Kutama, who established the Fatimids in Northern Africa and expanded their lands across the Mediterranean, were left desolate to the point of extinction after Cairo was established. The most notable of these is the revolt of Abu Raqwa. After being excommunicated from the Umayyad royal family in Spain, Abu Raqwa found himself in the company of the Bedouins of Northern Egypt. With a combination of political activism and Messianic Sunni preaching, Abu Raqwa leveraged the animosity between the tribes and the government to mount a revolt against al-Hakim. Cairo summoned an army to suppress the newest uprising, but the Bedouin used their knowledge of the land to their advantage, keeping the Fatimids at bay. Instead, al-Hakim ordered his high-ranking officials to write letters to Abu Raqwa, swearing their allegiance to Sunni Islam if Abu Raqwa met with them in Cairo. Given how al-Hakim had been treating his own officials until this point, we can only guess how enthusiastic they were to write these letters. Convinced by the flood of apparent support, Abu Raqwa made his way to Giza in August 1006. With the home field advantage, al-Hakim launched another attack on Abu Raqwa's forces. Overwhelmed, Abu Raqwa and his surviving troops fled south. Those who were killed or captured were paraded through Cairo, celebrating al-Hakim's success. The rebels were hunted down further, and Abu Raqwa was found a few weeks later. Al-Hakim paraded the captured rebel through the streets of Cairo, where he was beaten and stoned by the Fatimid citizens, nearly to the point of death. He was crucified and his head placed in Al-Hakim's head storage. Did I mention Al-Hakim had a storehouse specifically for the heads of his enemies? Abu Raqwa's body and the bodies of 30,000 rebels were loaded onto camels and carried through the empire, eventually being dumped into the Euphrates in Syria. According to Andani, Al-Hakim took this opportunity to shift from pro-Shia policy to pan-Islamic policy. Part of this included banning public defamation of the Rashidun Caliphs, something that was accepted by other Shia leaders and encouraged by al-Hakim. This way, he could hope to reunite the population, who was mostly Sunni, with the Fatimid cause. This change in policy had its effects outside the empire as well. As al-Hakim started getting chummy with the Sunnis, Sunnis and Shia outside the empire were starting to get chummy with him. Alids, members of the Prophet's family who were given local leadership positions in the Abbasid Caliphate, began to pledge loyalty to the Ismaili Imam. With growing public support, Ismaili Dais in Abbasid territory became more vocal and gained more support. Shia Islam relies heavily on the idea of lineage from the Prophet. The current leader of all Shia groups, present or otherwise, is a descendant of the Prophet through his daughter, Fatima, and son-in-law, Ali. The Fatimids at that time held a near monopoly on the Prophet's lineage, even naming themselves after that connection Fatima, and often publicly proclaimed their familiar relation to her and the Prophet. Quote, Based on their descent from Fatima, the Fatimid Imam Caliphs referred to the Prophet Muhammad as their grandfather, to whose legal, political, and religious authority they were heirs, and whose dawah and commandments they had come to fulfill. The Abbasids had also risen to power on a campaign of lineage through the Prophet's uncle, 
Abbas ibn Abd al-Muttalib. The rise of the Fatimid Empire, seemingly out of nowhere, posed a major threat to the Abbasid Caliphate. Now, the response to al-Hakim's new policies brought the conflict to Abbasid Caliph al-Qadr's home turf. Fights started to break out between Shia and Sunni communities in Baghdad. Alids and Bedouin leaders were now publicly declaring their allegiance to the Fatimids and praising al-Hakim in the streets. At first, the Caliph stayed out of it, but when it got too close for comfort, he sent a small battalion to quell the unrest outside his palace. Quote, his personal intervention in this confrontation thus highlights his sensitivity to the growing success of the Fatimid Dawah. Unquote. Al-Qadr was pushed over the edge. This is the eye of the hurricane. This is the only way he can protect his legacy. The Baghdad Manifesto. The one who has arisen in Egypt is Al-Mansur ibn Nazar with the title Al-Hakim. May the judgment of God upon him be one of destruction, annihilation, and humiliation, eradication, and exemplary punishment. And those who preceded him of his foul and impure predecessors, upon him and them the curse of God and the curse of all those who curse, or false clements, and those who seceded who do not have lineage amongst the sons of Ali ibn Abi Talib, that this one who has arisen in Egypt, he and his predecessors are infidels, libertines, debauchees, deviators, and materialist mannequins, they do not believe in Islam. Returning to the conversation that started this journey, my friend added, I assume this was the doing of some Abbasid writers. There were many writings against the validity of the Fatimid Caliphs, but none of them are as official as the Baghdad Manifesto. Published in 1011, this was the culmination of decades of anti-Fatimid propaganda, signed off by an incredibly distraught Caliph and dozens of other members of Abbasid leadership. Though this document carries the same gravitas as Hamilton's Reynolds pamphlet post-2015, Walker mentions it only once in passing in the Caliph of Cairo. Dr. Shane Jiwa, who I'm citing in this section, notes that once actual Ismaili accounts of the early Fatimid Empire made their way into academia, texts such as the Baghdad Manifesto fell out of favor as inaccurate propaganda. Jiwa argues that due to the pro-Fatimid declarations made by local leaders, the Baghdad Manifesto may not have been affected if it, even in its own time. However, because it was signed by many leaders in Baghdad, it served as a unifying document against the Fatimids. The manifesto continues. The Fatimid Caliphs have abrogated the mandates of Islamic law, allowed sexual licentiousness, permitted the drinking of alcohol, spilt blood, insulted the prophets, cursed the companions of the prophet, and proclaimed divinity. The manifesto claims al-Hakim subverted Islamic law. But the ones listed were either heavily implemented or in the process of being heavily implemented at the time of the manifesto's publishing in 1011. Until al-Hakim, the Fatimid Empire didn't force its non-Muslim constituents to obey Islamic law. But now, they were. Maybe this publication influenced al-Hakim's decision to unilaterally enforce Islamic prohibitions more than he already had. But, Jiwa's implication that the manifesto wasn't impactful would dissuade this idea. Anyway, that's the whole thing. The document itself is a paragraph long nah -uh, citing no sources or evidence, only the authority of the Abbasid leadership. It was a document meant to convince the Abbasids, not the Fatimids. Just like any other illness, mental illnesses become more severe without adequate treatment. After the death of his physician, Ibn Anastas, Al-Hakim not only received no treatment of his diagnosis, but perhaps no acknowledgement of it either. During Al-Hakim's lifetime, the Fatimids had only scratched the surface of mental illness, and it would have been highly stigmatized. Remember, Ismaili Dawah places a heavy emphasis on the intellect, 
and any impediment to one's intellect, especially that of the imam, would have been challenged. We can clearly see across al-Hakim's career a pattern of more extreme actions ultimately leading to self-destruction. Religious scholars outline the last seven years of al-Hakim's reign as his most extreme due to the significance of the number seven in Ismaili numerology. But there isn't a hard cutoff at seven years. Although it seems accelerated during that time, al-Hakim's descent is inconsistent, gradual, and spans his entire career. During this time, al-Hakim furthered restrictions on women, but loosened restrictions on Christians and Jews. He increases payments and gifts to his constituents, but also bribes teenagers to jump to their death for his amusement. It's around this time that al-Hakim makes two incredibly quizzical decisions about his rule. He appoints his cousin, Ibn Ilyas, as his heir, in complete opposition to the established rules of succession. He then appoints another cousin, Ibn Shuyab, as his heir, concurrently. The two are differentiated by their titles. Ibn Ilyas is the heir designate for the Muslims, and Ibn Shuyab is the heir designate for the Ismailis. With these appointments, the affairs of state were almost completely out of al-Hakim's hands. Most of the day-to-day decision-making was done by his cousins and other officials. With the empire under control, al-Hakim became even more reclusive. His excursions became more frequent, sometimes lasting an entire week, riding a donkey instead of his designated horse. He let his hair and nails grow out. Instead of his regal attire, he wore black robes and a black turban for so long without changing that they started to rot. Instead of tending to his government, he would ride amongst the people. Sometimes he would talk to them and laugh. Some scholars use this subdued attire in interactions with the public as evidence that he was a man of the people, checking in with his constituents outside the palace formalities. This may have been the case, but over time, he would redirect the people's comments and petitions to his cousins or ignore them entirely. On one occasion, he slaughtered a butcher's apprentice in the street for seemingly no reason. Another time, he ordered a guard to sodomize a local merchant, presumably for dishonest trade, in a story that has been immortalized in the Egyptian phrase, bringing Masud. Al-Hakim ordered the destruction of Fustat, Egypt's capital before Cairo, much to the confusion of its own residents. The last seven years of al-Hakim's life were torturous for many in Egypt, as the caliph wrestles both with his people and with himself. While many historians equate them to madness, some contemporaries see al-Hakim's eccentricities as something more profound. Ahmad bin Ibrahim al-Naisaburi, an Ismaili dai, wrote Proof of Imamat, which describes in detail the spiritual origin and the importance of the Ismaili imamat with a focus on al-Hakim. Al-Naisaburi argues that al-Hakim's extreme implementation of Islamic law was due to his proximity to the divine. Al-Naisaburi draws parallels between al-Hakim and the prophets and even calls him a messiah, stopping short of declaring the imam God himself Al-Naisaburi asserts that he is certainly not human. This belief is shared by many Ismailis, but not all, today, who see the Imam as something beyond the natural, far superior to humans. The Druze carry this belief one step further, asserting that Al-Hakim, as well as selected Imams and Prophets, were divinity incarnate. This is the utmost blasphemy not only in Islam, but in Ismailism as well. The founder of the Druze faith, and its early adherents were lambasted by Ismaili Dais and Fatimid leadership for their apostasy, which is described as such. Al-Hakim's inscrutable actions and policies, his inexplicable alterations of behavior and mood, and unprecedented attempts to impose new order through laws and regulations, all have a special meaning revealed solely to Hamza, the prophet of the Druze faith, who alone could explain them to those who followed him, those who have accepted the reality of the situation in which Al-Hakim is God himself. These ideas are presented by Al-Hassan Al-Akram, a former Ismaili Dai, Abu Abdullah Al-Darazi, for whom the Druze movement is named, and Hamza Al-Zuzani, the prophet interpreting Al-Hakim's divine message. Al-Akram took the lead in spreading this message and, despite the resistance of the Ismaili Dais and the public at large, Al-Hakim gave him space to speak and even bestowed him with special honors in his court. Because of his heretical teachings, Al-Akram was slaughtered by a mob in Cairo and his house was raided. 
Hamza took over as the leader of the movement and, in his treatises, wrote about his long talks with the caliph on his now daily excursions. When Hamza brings his followers to a Fustat mosque, they're met with a similar backlash from the locals. Al-Hakim intervenes and arrests those that attack the early Druze in Fustat and even replaces the local police for their infraction. When Turkish troops raided Al-Darazi's house, Al-Darazi was Turkish, he had already been secreted away to Al-Hakim's palace. Rumors circulate that the caliph sent Al-Darazi to Wadi Al-Taim in Lebanon, where the Druze community thrives until today. Despite the backlash from the entire Muslim community, especially the Ismailis, the Druze movement was able to rise to prominence under al-Hakim's support and affection. With the founders' dispatch, the next Fatimid Caliph al-Zahir couldn't snuff out the Druze completely. We will never know if al-Hakim agreed with the Druze, if he really thought he was a god. But he relished in the idea enough for it to take a foothold against all odds. And it's not hard to see why. When al-Hakim believed the world, his advisors, his family, his subjects, not to mention the rival empires, were against him, a handful of papers saying everything he was doing was true and just could have been the only reinforcement he needed. I would be remiss to tell a story about the Mad Caliph and not mention the greatest influence on his life. Sitt al-Mulk was her father's favorite, the daughter of his favorite concubine as well. At three years old, she traveled with her family to the newly built Cairo and settled into a dynastic life. While her father was the caliph, she would oversee the affairs of state, learning what she could from the advisors. She even commanded her own army. As a child, Sitt al-Mulk learned the ins and outs of the government, the military, and the treasury, as well as the people of Cairo, the diversity of their thoughts and practices. And she had all the makings of a strong and compassionate ruler from a young age. When her brother, or half-brother depending on the source, became the caliph at age 11, she kept her position in the palace. Al-Hakim was young and inexperienced. She used her connections to government officials to help her brother take the reins of his new empire. Because of her intimate knowledge, not only of the government but of the people who ran it, she was able to sniff out backroom dealings and the seeds of treason and bring them to Al-Hakim's attention. They conversed on strategy and policy. Sitt al-Mulk sharing her experience and expertise easily, but their partnership couldn't last forever. In spite of Sitt al-Mulk's guidance, al-Hakim began to see treachery everywhere. Despite her insistence to the contrary, he would begin enacting stricter and more violent rule. Sitt al-Mulk tried to rein her brother in, tried to soothe his temper. It worked at first, but as the years went on, he stumbled further and further to the cliff's edge. Eventually, al-Hakim's temperament became so unmanageable that his wife and child moved into Sitt al-Mulk's house, originally a gift from the young al-Hakim when he first became caliph, and a memory of the time that he shared with his sister. The final breaking point came after the destruction of Fustat in 1020, a final retaliation for their treatment of al-Hakim's fan club, the Druze. Al-Hakim accused his sister of losing her virginity, both a moral and political issue given her position, and threatened to kill her for it. The two cut ties entirely. When Al-Hakim disappeared, the 50-year-old Sitt al-Mulk did what she could to preserve the Fatimid Empire. She quickly dispatched of Ibn Ilyas and Ibn Shuyab, the two cousins Al-Hakim had designated heir, and replaced them with Al-Hakim's son, their rightful successor according to Shia doctrine. With Caliph Azahir safely on the throne, Sitt al-Mulk set to work dismantling the draconian policies her brother had instituted, restructuring the Caliph's advisory, eradicating the remaining Druze, and searching for those responsible for her brother's death. In just two years of her regency, she restored the Fatimid Empire to the way it was before the Mad Caliph's reign. Her poise and resolute command and quick action after the death of her brother raised speculation around the world. Buyid historian Halal al-Sabi creates an in-depth narrative which places Sitt al-Mulk at the center of a conspiracy seeking to overthrow her brother and restore order to the empire. Al-Sabi describes Sitt al-Mulk inviting Ibn Zawas, the first suspect in the caliph's murder, into her plot, promising land, money, and military leadership. Then we see al-Hakim reading his own horoscope, which he had already made illegal, and setting off on his nightly journey towards his foretold demise. Once he leaves, Sitt al-Mulk gives the signal to bandits who slaughter al-Hakim and his stable hand. 
Ibn Dawas then brings the corpse of the caliph back and helps Sitt al-Mulk bury the body under her home. Of course, this story is filled with juicy details that would have been impossible to ascertain, but the intrigue and mystery have solidified the legend. If Sitt al-Mulk had a hand in her brother's demise, her reputation would say she's far too methodical to be caught. It would be irresponsible for me to try and diagnose a historical figure, especially one who is revered by millions of people around the world with any sort of illness, mental or otherwise. Thankfully, I don't have to. What follows is a description of Al-Hakim's condition from Yahya of Antioch. The victim of this illness imagines astonishing things, and there is doubt in his mind that he is right in what he imagines about everything he does. It does not prevent him from doing these things, and nothing turns him back. Of these people, there is outworldly a confusion of speech, but the disturbance in his condition is not revealed to those who see and talk with him. The suspicion about him disappears at first sight. Sometimes a man's insanity is not apparent in his speech, and these hallucinations and destructive thoughts occur in him about matters that are hidden from the common people. If they prolong their examination, they would discover what was concealed from them about their destruction. This is a picture of the condition of Al-Hakim. His deterioration would be clear to whoever had a long association with him. Yahya continues to describe the specifics of Al-Hakim's affliction, summarizing what we've already talked about and more that we'll cover later. He also outlines Ibn Anastas's prescribed treatment. Today, the term melancholia is most often equated to major depressive disorder, with many of its historical symptoms overlapping with the modern diagnosis. While the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual warns not to conflate major depressive disorder with, quote, delusional disorder or other unspecified and specified schizophrenia spectrum and other psychotic disorders, unquote, Yahya's emphasis on delusions and erratic behavior would indicate that this particular diagnosis may be the latter. Of course, the Fatimids didn't have the DSM-5. At the time of Caliph al-Hakim, melancholia was described as an excess of black bile, particularly in the brain. al akhwaini Bukhari, a physician who lived just before al-Hakim rose to power, describes malakhulia as Fear without a known etiology, and this disease occurs without fever. They speak pointlessly and sometimes cry, and sometimes laugh at themselves, and when you ask them something, they can't respond or tell a falsity and stick to it. al akhwaini goes on to describe delusions of grandeur and mimicking behaviors. In addition to the phobias, appetite changes, and impact on decision-making described by previous scholars, he also describes the condition as chronic, citing a patient who suffered consistently for 30 years. The picture of melancholia painted from ancient Greece to Allah Akhwaini is a spectrum of disorders, from mild but persistent sadness to debilitating delusions. This aligns with both the diagnosis by Al-Hakim's contemporaries and modern psychology. Individuals with schizophrenia may display inappropriate effect. Example, laughing in the absence of an appropriate stimulus, a dysphoric mood that can take the form of depression, anxiety or anger, a disturbed sleep pattern, example, daytime sleeping and nighttime activity, and a lack of interest in eating or food refusal depersonalization, derealization, and somatic concerns may occur and sometimes reach delusional proportions. Anxiety and phobias are common. Cognitive deficits and schizophrenia are common and are strongly linked to vocational and functional impairments. These deficits can include decrements in declarative memory, working memory, language function, and other executive functions, as well as slower processing speed. We don't have any insights into the personal life or appetites of the caliph, so we can't confirm all the criteria listed above. However, we can clearly see the results of anxiety or phobias, as well as persecutory delusions towards his staff, family, and constituents. Over the course of his reign, the caliph executed countless numbers of his own staff and citizens. 
It's so excessive that historians stop recording the specifics of who and why after a while, saying, for example, quote, a great number of eunuchs, household servants, clerks, and others were executed during this year, unquote. Many of these executions were perceived crimes against the caliph. Even Walker admits that while al-Hakim was charging and executing his own staff on suspicions of treason, we see no indication from his staff, those charged or otherwise, of actual treachery. Executions for actual crimes were public spectacles, with reports of citizens paying to get a good view of the flogging and throwing the choicest rocks at prisoners. And unfortunately, some met their end at al-Hakim's hand for no crime other than being near him at the wrong time. There is no public policy to justify these acts. There is no religious doctrine. When we look at murders from our favorite murder podcast, it's quick and easy to apply some sort of psychopathy or sociopathy to the person, declaring that they don't have empathy or that they were seeking some feeling of power. I want to remind the listener that despite the atrocities listed before, the caliph was extremely empathetic. Al-Hakim's generosity for some historians outshines his cruelty. He was a patron of the arts and sciences and a large financial supporter of orphans and former slaves, as were all Fatimid caliphs. In the final years of his reign, al-Hakim's generosity exceeded even his own wealth. Those who worked for the caliph were substantially rewarded with riches, sometimes totaling millions of dollars today. Al-Makrizi describes gifts that the caliph bestowed on Hussein ibn Johar for his appointment as commander-in-chief. He received a red brocaded robe, a blue scarf with gold thread, a sword and bows in gold, a horse to ride complete with golden saddle and bridle, and three horses to carry an additional 50 robes of every sort. At the same time, honors were granted to Fahd, his assistant, including a mule to ride and another to carry 20 robes. He spent a lot of his personal money feeding, clothing, and educating the poor of Cairo and former slaves. All of this during an economic recession. Paradoxically, the reign of Caliph al-Hakim was filled with both exaggerated generosity and exaggerated ire, often at the same time, as demonstrated by this narration regarding al-Hakim's chief justice and commander-in-chief. On 11 January 1009, Abd al-Aziz ibn al-Numan was arrested. Hussein ibn Jawar was sought, but he fled with his two sons and a group of others. Much clamor in the household of Abd al-Aziz ensued. The shops of Cairo were closed as well as its markets. Then Abd al-Aziz was set free and the crier passed through Cairo saying that no one should close up. After three days, Hussein reappeared with his two sons. They went to Al-Hakim and he ordered them to keep to their houses. A robe of honor was given him and Abd al-Aziz and their children and a letter of amnesty written for them. Yes, those are the Ibn Numan and Ibn Johar that you're thinking of. Both are prodigious figures in the Fatimid Empire, but after a party outside the city resulted in the death of Ibn Anastas, both quickly fell out of favor. Al-Makrizi continues in the next year's report. On 24 June 1010, Hussein Ibn Johar, his children and his brother-in-law, Abd al-Aziz, and his children fled in a group with property and weapons. They departed at night. In the morning, Al-Hakim sent horsemen searching for them until dark, but they did not catch them. Their homes were seized and the contents taken to the Bureau of Sequestration. The rest of what was in the houses of Hussein ibn Johar and Abd al-Aziz was transported to the palace after having been inventoried and stamped by the Qadi Malik al-Said. On 18th August 1010, Ibn Abdun the Christian was removed from office. The reason for the removal of Ibn Abdun from the office of Wasita was due to letters by Al-Hakim sent repeatedly to the commander-in-chief Hussein Ibn Jawhar and to his brother-in-law Abd al-Aziz offering amnesty and their safe return. Ibn Jawhar, however, refused to come back as long as Ibn Abdun was the Wasita. Ibn Abdun was accordingly removed. Hussein, along with Abd al-Aziz and those who left with them, then presented themselves. Mounts carrying gifts were led in front of them. They appeared before Al-Hakim, then went out, having been forgiven by him. So, 
Here we have a story of two of the caliph's closest advisors. These are men whose families have served the Fatimid Caliphate for generations and would have been a presence in al-Hakim's entire life. Al-Hakim himself bestowed them with the highest rank in their fields, and they often accompanied him on his daily excursions and were granted a seat on the pulpit during his religious sermons. After a single allegation of attending a party, the caliph seizes their property, but still asks them to return to their positions. He even fires one of his best officials to get them back, saying, quote, No one served me better or achieved in his service what Ibn Abdun, the fired official, achieved. Unquote. And once Hussein and Abdul Aziz are back in his employ, all their property is returned, along with expensive gifts and new titles. Everyone involved received letters of amnesty, public declarations of the caliph's thanks and admiration. The men were often welcomed back into the personal company of the caliph, the highest of honors for an Ismaili or a Fatimid. This is one of the many examples of the caliph's kindness and mercy that allows us to rule out pure psychopathy. Hussein ibn Jawar and Abdul Aziz were arrested once again, jailed for three days, and then, when they swore not to absent themselves from the court and testify to that personally, they were set free. Al-Hakim swore as much in a letter of amnesty he wrote for them. Ibn Abdun was jailed and ordered to make an accounting, but then hung and his funds confiscated. On 21st January 1011, Hussein ibn Jawar and Abdul Aziz rode to the palace as was their practice. When the receiving agent went out to them, he said to Hussein, Abdul Aziz and Abu Ali, the brother of Al-Fadl, Obey the command to what the caliph wants of you. The three sat and the other people departed. Thereupon, the three of them were arrested and killed in a single moment. The Numans and the Johars were the closest thing the Fatimid caliphs had to family friends. Even a psychopath would understand the political importance of keeping those bloodlines on your team. Johar was responsible for securing all of North Africa and establishing Cairo. Numan centralized the Ismaili Dawa, we still use his works today. If al-Hakim was purely enacting a pro-Shia and pro-Ismaili stance, those two families should have been safe. And yet they're summarily executed with no fanfare, overshadowed in reports by a baby lamb that kinda looks like a person. I'm not making that up. We can reasonably conclude that these executions, the execution of Barjawan mentioned earlier, and the hundreds of others that the caliph personally ordered and presided over were not to further a political cause. Something else affected these decisions. He was unable to see allyship even when it's been present his entire life. He was my age when he executed Ibn Numan and Ibn Johar. It's difficult to know exactly why the caliph executed those closest to him in the government, even with al makrisis detailed reports. But to provide context to the relationship between Fatimid Caliph and his advisors, we can briefly look at Caliph al-Aziz's advisory. It would be an understatement to say al-Aziz was underprepared for his role in leadership. He was the third in line for the throne until less than a week before ascending it. Throughout his caliphate, al-Aziz relied heavily on the judgment and work of his advisors for no other reason than that he never actually learned how to be a caliph. Al-Aziz even appointed a wazir, an advisor with nearly all the authority of the caliph. While al-Hakim didn't appoint a wazir, he utilized many advisors, mediators, and other officials to conduct his government. Walker describes the tremulous relationship between the Fatimid caliphs and their advisors. The whole system was vast. The caliph stood at its head, but even a ruler as directly involved as al-Hakim was could not hope to control more than a small portion of it. Nevertheless, what the government did, what actions it carried out successfully or failed to perform properly, affected how the imam at the top was judged. Was he to blame for its inaction or malfunction? Do we credit him for its accomplishments? The fact that the new caliph was 11 years old compounded the work on the advisors and further reduced it on the young al-Hakim. Throughout Fatimid history, the caliph's advisors often undermined decisions or sought to fill their own pockets. This tense relationship between the caliph and his advisors remained well past al-Hakim and was, in my understanding, the main contributing factor in both the initial collapse of the empire in 1094 and its final end in 1171. If paranoia affected al-Hakim, 
we can clearly see why it would have been directed first and foremost at Fatimid advisors. Whether the advisors were earnestly trying to help or secretly undermining the young caliph, any confrontation to his absolute rule could be cause for alarm. And that alarm could quickly be amplified by schizophrenic anxiety to the point of violent retaliation. After Barjawan's execution, ordered by the 13-year-old caliph, all of al-Hakim's highest-ranking advisors except maybe three were executed, lasting in office anywhere between five days and five years. Most executions were cited with evidence for failures in official duties, stealing or misappropriation of government funds, or suspected treason. Walker admits, quote, Although eventually executed, none of the figures who were put to death by order of al-Hakim had actually rebelled against him. In most cases, we do not know what caused the caliph's anger or what crime might have brought about this punishment. Most of the men cited persisted in a display of loyalty, real or feigned, until the end. The caliph's family was not exempt from his suspicions. In 1004, Abdullah ibn Hashan, the paternal uncle of al-Hakim, attended a party where his astrologer friend, presumably, jokes about Abdullah assuming the role of caliph. When this was reported back to al-Hakim, he took the matters into his own hands. And by matters, I mean his sword stabbing into his uncle. On rumors of another uncle starting his own dawah, al-Hakim had all his assets seized. Two more of his cousins met their eventual end at al-Hakim's sword on suspicions of treason. Disrupted sleep appears to be closely tied to schizophrenia, and it is often observed in individuals even prior to illness onset. Specifically, disturbed sleep, with insomnia being the most frequent sleep disturbance, has been found to be the most commonly reported symptom during the prodromal phase of illness, which is characterized by a wide range of unspecific, diagnostically inconclusive symptoms. Until recently, the connection between disruptive sleep in patients with schizophrenia spectrum disorders has not been effectively studied, as schizophrenia usually takes priority over insomnia. However, the two seem to be intimately linked, with disruptive sleep exacerbating schizophrenic symptoms and often worsening the illness greatly over time. The doctor had diagnosed the caliph as suffering from a kind of melancholia, a form of depression. His treatment for this condition was a regimen that had the patient sit in a tub of oil of violet while listening to singing girls. According to our information, this treatment worked well and seemed to alleviate al-Hakim's symptoms. Walker notes briefly the caliph's diagnosis as well as his treatment. Violet oil is a traditional Iranian medicine used to treat insomnia. The Fatimid physicians would have been familiar with this traditional treatment, but it has also been studied recently by the University of Mashhad. The results of the study showed that viola oil could have a significantly positive effect on inducing sleep in patients and chronic insomnia with few adverse effects. As it is made in the basis of oil and consumed from nasal route, it has more effects with lower doses. In addition, it was found that unlike current hypnotic drugs, VO consumption does not make the patient resistant to VO, and even it acts more effectively a few days after taking the drug. The caliph's treatment was administered often, sometimes multiple times a day. While they were effective, those effects quickly wore off. However, this was the only successful treatment we have documented. The report of this treatment, brief as it is, indicates that the caliph's extreme tendencies were treatable with medicine but that treatment could only last a few years. After his physician died at a party in 1007, the caliph remained untreated for the rest of his life. Without treatment to keep his insomnia or mental illness in check, and in line with Kaski et al's study, this could have increased his schizophrenic symptoms greatly, which we will explore soon. Extending beyond his medical treatment and until his death, al-Hakim also partook in nightly horse rides out of the city gates, with little to no accompaniment, the caliph would ride for hours in the night. This is another obvious example of insomnia, a restless caliph keeping himself up sometimes the whole night. Little is known about the specifics of these rides. There are a few accounts of the route he took. But because he was alone, most reports only note when he left the city and when he returned. These late night excursions eventually led to the caliph's disappearance. 
it would now seem that we have our explanation. Al-Hakim's extreme policies, his love of executions and public torture, his seemingly random changes from excessive generosity to excessive cruelty, his relationship to his family and friends, even his nightly donkey rides. Not one, but two contemporary physicians confirm this diagnosis. And through this lens, we no longer see a tyrant or an extremist. We see a man struggling to do what's right in a world that terrifies him. So why haven't we seen this explanation before? There are two sources that Walker pulls from that discuss the mental health or the general health at all of Caliph al Hakim, Ibn Anastas, the Caliph's personal physician, and Yahya of Antioch, Ibn Anastas's friend who is also a physician. Ibn Anastas and Yahya's accounts are both briefly presented earlier, but Yahya's is considerably more in depth. This is the only time in Caliph of Cairo that Walker expresses what I would consider bias. After confirming that Ibn Anastas would have a more intimate knowledge of the Caliph than any other contemporary, he dismisses the physician's report outright. You'll remember that his treatment of al-Hakim included warm baths and singing girls. Ibn Anastas was a talented musician and was killed by a bath. Instead of drawing the conclusion that music and baths are both soothing and enjoyable, Walker concludes that Ibn Anastas's prescribed treatment was a frivolous act of hedonism. Walker then evokes Yahya's religion, both physicians were Christian, to say that his account of Ibn Anastas's medical findings were biased against the caliph. A few pages later, Walker praises Yahya for his accuracy in describing an event that he could not have witnessed, the alleged death of the caliph. Yahya likely wished for Muslim rulers more in the mode of al-Aziz, tolerant and benign, for the son to have been an obvious exception, incompetent by virtue of insanity, not typical or shared by other caliphs, suited his view in the matter. In truth, moreover, what he suggests about al-Hakim's condition does not fit, nor does it explain more than a tiny portion of his constant activity. He did not cease to run his government, nor to monitor the affairs of state, as far as we can tell. If anything, he increased his supervision of them, appointing new, and in some ways, more capable men to office. What Walker demonstrates here is a fundamental misunderstanding of mental illness and the diversity of its expression. Schizophrenia specifically can be partially genetic, but is more influenced by factors such as conditions at birth and brain development, which we have no historical record of as well as childhood trauma and overall stress, which we have plenty of evidence for. We've already described how his political decisions can be affected by mental illness, and the few glimpses we have into his personal affairs provide even more. Despite my surprise at this sudden partiality, I don't blame Walker for his conclusions. Incompetent by virtue of insanity is an incredibly telling phrase. If Al-Hakim was insane, he must have been incompetent. This is the stigma around mental health. Even today, we see this sort of illness as a deficiency, as a character flaw. Mental illness, just like any other illness, is an inflicted impediment, not an intrinsic one. And like other illnesses that can emerge internally, mental illnesses can be addressed and treated. In Stigma, Notes on the Management of Spoiled Identity, Irving Goffman describes how stigmas are used to discount a person's value entirely at once, saying a person is, quote, thus reduced in our minds from a whole and usual person to a tainted, discounted one, unquote. Stigmas, Goffman explains, are a natural tendency for pattern-seeking people and are often justified and reinforced after being established. This is why I still understand the academic integrity of the scholars I've cited and don't blame them for shaping this part of Al-Hakim's narrative to fit their message. But stigmas create an alternative reality, devoid of evidence, understanding, and empathy. Those who are stigmatized are often cast aside for not living up to unrealistic, uncommunicated expectations. Accepting insanity while harboring the stigma would mean admitting that al-Hakim was deficient as a person, as a caliph, and as an imam. Instead of deconstructing the stigma, many, including Walker, attempt to deny the diagnosis. Since his rule began until today, al-Hakim has been constantly stigmatized. Some declare he is universally evil, while others declare he is universally divine, but both sides miss the person in the middle. 
Whether a historian reinforces the evil nature of al-Hakim or seeks to absolve him of it, there is a certain level of denial necessary to maintain the stigma. Even Andani falls into the same trap, accusing the historic label of insanity as being, frankly, uh, frankly a, a very lazy, lazy thing, thing for, for historians, historians to do. Uh, in fact, Andani continues Walker's dismissal of Ibn Anastas's work, like, saying, the, 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 the doctor, doctor that did diagnose al Hakim with some sort of mental condition, he probably had mental problems of his own. So that's not very reliable either. Later, praising the physician anyway, for his thoroughness. Here we can see the stigma at work. After declaring it inappropriate for a historian to diagnose these illnesses, Andani uses his own assumptions to the, dismiss the historical record. In explaining the caliph's actions, Andani uses many of the same sources and rationales that I've used so far, and I agree with most of his points. But there is a fundamental difference in our bias approaching this subject. Andani starts from the expectation that al-Hakim cannot be insane. And it is our assumptions, our stigma, not the historical record which I am writing to address. Throughout Ismaili Dawah, there has been a notion shared that the Imam is perfect. This perfection has been accepted without question by many of those who practice Ismailism, but is still a topic of conversation for those who study the faith. Qadi Newman, for example, lays out examples of the Imam's perfect judgment in his code of conduct for the followers of the Imam. More recently, scholars like those at Ismaili Gnosis argue for a perfection of faith. Those who study Ismailism assert that the perfection ascribed to the Imamath is not an all-encompassing perfection for the simple fact that only God is all-encompassingly perfect. The belief in a perfect Imam often comes under question, especially when it comes to physical perfection. We can pull an example from as recently as 2008 when Imam Shah Karim broke his shoulder in a skiing accident. If the Imam is perfect, how can he have a skiing accident? How can he sustain an injury? Just as important to the perfection of the Imam is the humanity of the Imam. The cattle chapter of the Quran explains why religious scripture is delivered by a human instead of the supernatural. So while the position of the Imam can be described as supernatural, as it is by al Naisaburi and countless others, it's important to understand that a human fills that position. In the summer of 996, Caliph al-Aziz, al-Hakim's father, fell ill. A combination of gallstones, gout, and colic confined him to his home and bathhouse. More than throughout his career, the affairs of state were handled by his advisors. His insistence on carrying out a campaign into Syria was denied by them. The empire continued to run without the Caliph for months until al-Aziz succumbed to his illnesses in October of that year. I raise these points not to diminish the beliefs of the Ismailis or even the Druze, who hold the Imam to high standards. I just want to illustrate with history the fact that the human Imam is susceptible to illness and injury, just as we all are. Ismailis pride themselves on being the only Shia group with a present living Imam, but that fact comes with the acknowledgement of the mortality of all their previous Imams, a fact that our Shia brothers and sisters of other groups can confidently ignore. Despite his specific phrase of al-Hakim specifically, even al-Naisaburi admits that the imamath continues after the imam. I bring up al-Aziz because it illustrates a situation where illness prevented a Fatimid caliph from fulfilling his duties. This isn't an indictment of his person or his ability. Let's be cognizant of our assumptions here. How is al-Aziz held responsible for his illnesses? This wouldn't be a notebook entry if I didn't bring up Nasirian ethics, so I'll do that now. Moreover, the soul's control, being by means of organs, is apparent, for it feels by senses, and moves by muscles and nerves, and a detailed treatment for this is set down under natural sciences. What we see in the final months of Al-Aziz's reign was not a deficiency of his spiritual strength, but a physical manifestation interfering with his ability to express his physical strength. His illness prevented him from carrying out his duties as imam and caliph sufficiently. As a result, he was protected and prevented from running the empire in those intervening months. What we see with al-Hakim is the same problem, but with a different resolution. 
We've outlined how his judicial actions were rooted in the preservation of Shia law. His other actions, as we've explained, are extreme versions of otherwise normal behavior. What we're seeing is an illness impeding the actions of a person, not a deficit in the person themselves, just as Al-Aziz was impeded by his illness. The difference then is that Al-Aziz was relieved of his duties and treated, Al-Hakim was not. Because both caliphs were diagnosed and received at least some treatment, I believe this difference is caused by stigma. Al-Aziz's affliction manifested physically and could be detected at the time. I've had gallstones, they're extremely painful. But Al-Hakim's affliction didn't manifest as clearly. The only reason I talk about my mental illness is because most people wouldn't notice it otherwise. Medical professionals know, as is the case with Al-Hakim, but who listens to them? It would be far more advantageous to the Fatimids to ignore Al-Hakim's illness or even praise its consequences than it would be to treat the man. Why inflict such a final and ultimate judgment? One answer, propagated and possibly embellished by enemies of the state, was that Al-Hakim was himself unstable and prone to fits of pique sudden outbursts of ill temper and deadly anger. Yet there is also evidence of his goodwill and clemency in some matters that created consistent policy and that would seem to deny that his actions were simply the result of variations in mood. Is there reason to view the killings as in some manner justified? Walker raises a fair point, but I believe that the truth lies somewhere in between the two extremes. Many people throughout history and today have suffered debilitating mental illnesses which prevent them from acting in a way that is a true expression. We see a leg injury, for example, as an impediment. If untreated, a leg injury can become a permanent impediment. But as a community, we tend to view mental illnesses not as an impediment, but as a flaw with a person. With this mentality, mental illness often goes untreated or worse, unrecognized. As al-Hakim is remembered as a tyrant, someone who was decisive and cruel, despite his kindness, his generosity, and his piousness. Walker seems to be confused as to how a good person could do bad things after already dismissing a confirmed impediment to the Caliph's decision-making abilities. Had his illness been recognized in his time, he could have been treated and his more extreme actions could have been prevented. Over the course of researching and writing this, two Ismailis in the city where I live fell into the deepest end of mental illness, taking their own lives. Two of my former students attempted the same, two that I know of. Mental illness is so stigmatized within our community that even admitting a death by suicide is taboo. Before writing this, my students presented a community service project to raise awareness about mental illness, and the backlash from their own parents has stuck with me. My journey with the Mad Caliph has changed from a morbid fascination to a tragedy of shared experience. If it's not already obvious, I do have an agenda in reading this. The Mad Caliph is loved by those who know nothing of him, loathed by those who know a little about him, and lamented by those who know all there is to know. But his story is not unique, nor is it set in stone. If Al-Hakim fell victim to a schizophrenia spectrum disorder, which I believe he did, he can be a lesson to us today. We need to educate our own community on mental illness generally, as well as diminish the stigma that prevents education. I think a thorough examination of an already revered figure such as Khalif Al-Hakim could open that door, but only to those who see a door to open. After the reaction of my students' parents, I'm well aware that some would prefer this door stay closed.
As stated in the beginning, please read Caliph of Cairo by Paul E. Walker. Additionally, the Fatimids and their traditions of learning grant some insight on Al-Hakim by the foremost Fatimid expert, Heinz Holm. I find Dr. Shane Oljiwa's work on the Fatimids to be exceptional as well. Her analysis of the Baghdad Manifesto is from the Fatimid Caliphate, Diversity of Traditions. While I've read the book, I've cited an edited version available on the IIS website. Um, while I haven't read her book, The Fatimids, The Rise of the Muslim Empire, I'm told that it's a good introduction to the Fatimid Empire as a whole. I've also cited the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 5, which is surprisingly difficult to come by. Stigma, Notes on the Management of Spoiled Identity by Irving Goffman, provides an excellent introduction into the idea of stigma, not just for mental health, but generally. Schizophrenia and Sleep Disorders, Links, Risks, and Management and Challenges by Rachel E. Kasky, Bianca Graziano, and Fabio Farrarelli, as well as Efficacy of Viola Orodata in Treatment of Chronic Insomnia by Zore Fezabadi, Farha Jafri, Syed Hamid Kamali, Hassan Ashayari, and Shapur Badi Aval, Mohammed Mahdi Afsani, and Omid Sedagpur are available from the National Institute of Health. I've also skimmed a handful of other articles from the National Institute of Health for confirmation, but forgot to keep track of them. I've also cited a few videos, including Debunking the Mad Caliph by Dr. Khalid Landani, You Are What You Eat by Molana Sayed Muhammad Rizvi, and Uthman Ali and the First Civil War by al muqaddimah Let's follow the example of Caliph al muiz and not let this be where our research ends. When you finish one book, pick up another. On February 13th, 1021, Caliph al-Hakim rode his donkey, Qamar, along the foothills of Muqattam under a waning moon. He was stopped about an hour south of the city gates and sent away his two stablemen. That would be the last time anyone saw the mad Caliph. I can only relate to very little about al-Hakim's story, but his nightly journeys out of the gates of Cairo stands out. Walker describes these journeys as an obsession for the young caliph, parting the capital every night and every day towards the end of his life, sometimes not returning until after dawn or the next dawn. As described, insomnia can keep someone up, it can kick someone out of bed, but I'm not sure if it can pull al-Hakim out of his city. I can recall with requisite pain my own late night journeys leaving home well after the sun falls below the horizon and wandering for hours. The moonlight mingled with the streetlights, the odd traveler would pass along the road. Insomnia keeps me up, insomnia kicks me out of bed, but it wasn't insomnia that opened my door and pushed me into the streets. During my nighttime excursions, I was searching for peace. I lived with endless noise in my brain for just over half my life as of writing, and some nights when the world outside is silent, the world inside is overwhelming. Just as my turmoil is permanent, I search for a permanent peace those nights. I can't help but think Al-Hakim was on a similar search those nights he left the city, and many believe he found it. Fatimids believe that he met his end at the hands of bandits near the Okba ibn Amr Mosque, an hour south of the city gates. The Druze believe that he returned to his divine form that night. Others say he escaped the pressures of imperial life and found his solace in Fustat or Basra or some other place. When we talk about mental health, those who haven't experienced its effects often use the phrase a permanent solution to a temporary problem. but. As I explained in my notebook entry about the afterlife, I don't believe Al-Hakim has found his peace. Although I hope this can help. Thank you for listening.